Okay, uh, hello. Welcome everyone to the 12th webinar in the new barn raising webinar series. Uh, today's webinar is uh, Assets on Prescription. I'm uh, Gareth Potts, uh, the guy who uh, set up the webinar series. Uh, there is uh, a new barn raising uh, website that talks about the other resources in the new barn raising program. Um, so there is a toolkit on there, there's various articles that outline uh, these are all on different ways to sustain community and civic assets. Uh, all the resources are free. There's also links to uh, recordings of past webinars in this in this series uh, and to details of, of the remaining webinars in the series. So I hope you're able to, to give that a look. In terms of today's focus, uh, we're looking at how can uh, healthcare experts, general practitioners, medical professionals uh, help to raise awareness of community and civic assets that can meet uh, people's needs in terms of physical well-being and also mental mental health and men mental well-being. The first speaker is Diana O'Neill of the uh, New Zealand Ministry of Health. Diana is a senior advisor in primary healthcare implementation at the ministry. She has over 20 years of experience in national sport and recreation organizations and uh, that includes setting up the National Physical Activity Programme for older, older adults and the uh, Green Prescriptions Programme that she'll be talking about today. Uh, and Diana moved with that programme into the Ministry of Health in 2009. Uh, the second presentation will be on the Book Prescription Wales programme. Uh, kicking that off will be the originator of the, the concept of the Books on Prescription concept, Professor Neil Frude. Uh, Neil is a consultant clinical psychologist. He has honorary professorships at the University of Cardiff and the University of South Wales. He's a fellow of the British Psychological Society and in 2015 received its Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2012, he co-founded the Happiness Consultancy, which offers training and consultancy around positive psychology. Joining Neil is Sue Thomas of Public Health Wales. Uh, in 1989, Sue set up the Health Promotion Library uh, in Wales uh, and has worked on the Books on Prescription Scheme since it was set up. Uh, last year, she received the Welsh Librarian of the Year Award for Public Sector Libraries, uh, and she is also the co-chair of the European Association of Health Information and Libraries. Uh, I'm going to hand you over now to uh, Diana, who is in Wellington in New Zealand. So, Diana, over to you, please. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm really delighted to be talking about uh, green prescriptions. So here we go. Yes, a um, little uh, dot down the bottom in the southern hemisphere is New Zealand. And as you can see, the Ministry of Health is based in Wellington, the capital of New Zealand. These next couple of slides just show some of the things that New Zealand is um, famous for. A hutupawa tree that is called the New Zealand Christmas tree, and I'm really looking forward to seeing that in a few weeks. These are some of the sites that, that um, you will see when you come to New Zealand. And much of the wizardry for the Lord of the Rings movies were made in here in Wellington. If you've been following the Rugby World Cup, you will know that our All Blacks at the moment are the Rugby World Champions. Really interesting. This is what I'll be covering today, quite a lot to get through in a short period of time. This is New Zealand's health system, starting at the top with the Minister of Health, who just happens to be in um, London at the moment for a certain event. He is also the Minister of Recreation and Sport, which is uh, actually very unusual. It's only, he's only been in the role since the end of last year, and it's a unique situation to be in. Then we have the Ministry of Health, and then we have uh, 20 district health boards. There are about 30 primary health organisations. That's the box in the middle of the, the screen. And we have our Māori providers. That's our, the Māori are our Indigenous people, Pacific providers, and then we have general practice. We also have the usual NGOs, health agencies. Heart Foundation, Diabetes New Zealand, Arthritis New Zealand, etc. So it looks it looks pretty complicated, and if I was to put in the way the funding flows grow, you go, you would see how very complicated that is as well. Really important to the Green Prescription Initiative is the Regional Sports Trust Network, 
and you, you can see they cover the country and they're a really important way of getting messages out and delivering programs on behalf of Sport New Zealand or in our case now the Ministry of Health. So a green prescription is written advice for patients to be more active and improve their nutrition as part of their health management. The nutrition part was added when green prescriptions came to the Ministry in 2009. Green prescription was started by the Hillary Commission for Recreation and Sport and so we were interested in increasing physical activity and not so fussed about the nutrition but it's really good to have um, half and half now. So support is provided by trained support people. There are a whole heap, probably a couple of hundred people out there throughout New Zealand who are just as passionate as I am about green prescriptions. So green prescriptions is New Zealand's only GP referral scheme. I'm aware that in the UK there are lots and lots of schemes with lots and lots of uh, names but green prescription is it as far as New Zealand goes. And it has been proven to be effective and cost effective over 12 months. There's also a program for children and young people called Green Prescription Active Families and I'm particularly excited about this at the moment because last week New Zealand's Minister of Health launched a childhood obesity plan. Our uh, childhood obesity rates are very, very scary and so there's going to be more money going into active families in the coming years. So that is such good news. This is what the script looks like. Yes, you can see it is green. Um, I know it's fair to say that most referrers do refer electronically now and it goes through e um, by email through to the support people. If you can see that, you'll see that it's based on walking because, of course, walking is um, a great activity to get started. So the patient gives permission and the script goes through to support. There are two really important roles with green prescriptions that these two slides are probably the most the most important slides of the whole presentation. So this first one here is what happens in the primary healthcare role. So this is some a health professional who knows the, the full medical history. So it's usually general practitioners, practice nurses. We are now opening up prescribing rights to midwives, um, also as a result of the Childhood Obesity Plan so that midwives will be able to issue a green prescription for pregnant women with uh, gestational diabetes. So this is just around, really around the safety criteria. If there is a medical condition, it must be stable. And if the green prescription is appropriate, that means is the person ready to make lifestyle change? So that's sort of around um, behavioural matters and motivational interviewing. Now if permission is given, a script, either the green script or the a typed script, which of course is much, much easier to read, goes through to the support role. And most of these, as I said, are in the regional sports trusts. And this is on the health and, and obviously physical activity of the sort of sports trust. The other role is in the community, working with schools, getting kids into sport, not high performance, that is organization. So these support people are trained in motivational interviewing and goal setting. So it's almost, I guess, like a leisure counselling service. Talking to the person about the activities they feel they'd like to do, maybe activity that they did when they were younger, what they think they can do with their condition, and goal setting. We're getting some lovely stories now of people who've been given a green prescription and are making such lifestyle changes that they want to share the love and so they can become, be trained as fitness leaders or leaders of green prescription walking groups and, and that's, that's really nice. I really like it when that happens. The patients can also get a repeat script. It's sort of like any um, medication if you've um, got bronchitis and you get to the end of your script and you're not quite right, you can get a repeat script. This is the same for green prescriptions. So we get about a quarter repeat referrals a year and we know from our uh, monitoring that the people who did get longer support do actually have more positive health changes. So that's blindingly obviously really. 
The next two slides just show about the, the evidence around green prescription. Very important if you're working with clinicians, they would say, give us the evidence. So those are three randomized control trials. There is another one going on at the moment that's almost uh, due for completion. And the cost effectiveness as well. Uh, as probably in your health systems in New Zealand, it's all about saving the money but not compromise, compromising patient safety or experience. So here's how the referrals have gone right from the beginning. As you can see, it was a real struggle back in 1998 and part of that was, actually most of that was because it came from the recreation and sports sector, not from the health sector. But you see they've gone up in leaps and bounds and so this year we've got a pretty hefty target of almost 54,000 referrals. This is just a snapshot of what went on for Green Prescription in the last financial year. Almost 48,000 referrals. Now the focus on type 2 diabetes started to gain traction in 2013 when the, the government funded Green Prescription's $7.2 million more over the next four years to target type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. Our diabetes rates are horrific as are our obesity rates, and I'm afraid that um, our Māori and Pacific populations carry the, carry the brunt of that, that burden of disease. So you can see our stats there, and people say, hmm, how come you've only got a third males? And of course, as we know, it's just harder to get those men into the door of the, of the um, practice surgery. Age distribution, this remains pretty constant over the years and the group that does change will fluctuate from time to time is the 65 plus and that is largely because screen prescription can be used as a safety criteria for prevention programs. So screen prescription has got the ability to go across borders to many other uh, agencies and for example our Accident Compensation Corporation is the one charged with reducing falls in New Zealand and I'm doing a lot of work with them at the moment and so we will see that 20% of referrals for older people go up significantly I imagine. These next few slides talk about the annual patient survey and because I've been going for a few years with very few changes to methodology and questions we've got a wealth of information. Uh, all the survey report is up on the website. It's got 200 pages odd, but um, <laughs> you're most welcome to download it. So you can see there the breakdown of respondents. Māori and Pacific were uh, oversampled for the reasons that I've talked about before. Because of the si sample size, we're able to get the results by each contract holder. So each district health board gets their own scorecard. And I must say, there's quite a lot of competition between them too. And that's against the key performance indicators, and they come from the Green Prescription logic model. So here is the methodology. So it's looking at people who were given their Green Prescription six to eight months before. And then we have uh, special profiles for Maori, Pacific, and older adults. And these are really good ways for me to work across the ministry our Maori health team, our Pacific health team, and our older adults team. Main reasons for green prescription, pretty obvious here. Here again, they haven't changed too much over the years at all. Activity suggests are pretty obvious. You remember on the script that it was about walking. Walking was the activity most prescribed for obvious reasons. So easy to go at your own pace. Our walking, um, walking guide resource starts off with people walking out 10 minutes, back 10 minutes. And then often people, as we know, go on to other exercises after starting with walking. Uh, the community group seems to have dropped off. That should be 17%. So those are people who are exercising with people just like them. And that's fabulous to watch those. So the all-important key performance indicators. 
remembering that green prescription started off in the recreation and sport world, so this one was uh, particularly important. Now, uh, even a quarter of people who are still active about the same amount of time now, that's a good result because this is a starter program and it's really getting off the couch and starting to make a difference to your health. Changes in diet, there again, consistent results over the years. So the usual things here, drinking more water, portion, reducing portion sizes, fewer sugary drinks, unhealthy snacks, more fruit and vegetables, etc. Positive health changes, this is the, obviously it's subjective and it's all self-report, but it's just amazing how consistent the results have been over the years. Now this is really, really hard to see, but the one, there's a mixture here of qualitative and quantitative, so there's things like, ah, I'm feeling better now, I've got more energy, I'm motivated, through to the taking less medication, bloods have gone, blood sugar levels have gone down, etc. This is probably the most important key performance indicator. It wraps up a whole lot of other measures around satisfaction. And the target is minimum of 80% satisfied with the overall service, and you can see that it was well exceeded this year. We have other outcomes. This first one is around buy-in from general practice for green prescription. So it's when the patient goes back, and we know that these patients Patients do visit their GP many times because they have most have long-term conditions. So they are encouraged to keep up the good work with their activity because, of course, the doctor or nurse is able to see the measurable signs. So motivation, encouraging others to be more active, family and friends. The activities are relevant and appropriate. And there's that all-important understanding of benefits. Quotes like these that make my heart sing, really. It's um, just a really good news story. Yeah, we do get a few brickbacks as well. Um, people who wanted support um, to go on and on and on. They wanted their discounted gym to go on and on, etc. Um, the support is for three or four months, but as I said, the patient can get a repeat referral. Okay, on to the use of community assets. The first one I'm going to talk about is in Whanganui, which is a, little, um, a small city in the North Island. The Green Prescription Office is actually at the um, Splash Centre, and so that means that the staff are able to meet and greet the people. And, you know, for some of these people, it's pretty scary um, going into a facility like this. they also got rooms available for health promotion talks and other health, health professionals there as well. So this is Phyllis. Um, she's, a, she's a Maori woman um, and her story is a particularly lovely one. She's raised a family of three and for the last 21 years she's also looked after a special needs child. The doctor was worried about her weight she was um, at risk of stroke, heart attack, and diabetes, um, a lot of diabetes in Phyllis's family. Uh, she's given her green prescription, she's now eating healthier, and she's en encouraged a friend into the water. They started off in the water, water walking for 20 lengths, and then started swimming, and now she's got so much confidence that she is into the gym. She's become a gym bunny. That great. Celia, similar story, uh, weight issues and asthma. Got her green prescription in 2013. She's lost 18 kg since then and she's now training for a triathlon. So, food of thought. Next one is the YMCA in Auckland. You'll be familiar with the YMCA. Um, they also have trained staff, particularly in working with beginner exercises a range of activities. This is Sean. Sean, um, when he got his green prescription, he was in a bad way mentally and physically. He'd suffered depression on and off throughout his life. And he'd actually dropped out of university because he just couldn't cope. He got his green prescription. He built up, you can see there, what a proud man he is now. Um, his d depression is under control. 
He's almost finished his university studies. And he's now working with young people with uh, mental health and um, addiction problems. These are the green shuttles when I was in Auckland a couple of weeks ago. So these are people who got given a green prescription and then decided they'd like to uh, play badminton. And they, boy, what an amazing lot they are, bouncing off the walls with motivation. Two of them are cancer, su cancer survivors and they just say that social support they get is even better than playing badminton. Now, there are lots of benefits for the facility owners here. They get free media. Green Prescription gets a lot of media. If you go onto our website, you'll see lots of lovely success stories and all of the regions have regular slots in their local newspapers. This looks very flash, this velodrome, it's in Invercargill, which is down the south of the southern island of New Zealand, and it's an international velodrome, and our New Zealand cycling team train there, and they also have classes for cyclofit. So these people are green prescription patients who um, are quite happy on the flat, clearly, and if you can see over on the right, there's even a, a, a tricycle. And Graham, who was a 58-year-old butcher, when he had his stroke, he was paralysed down one side. And as part of his rehab was a goal to get onto one of these tricycles. He finally did it. He's just achieving his goal of, of walking unaided now. And so he's going on. He's now at the gym and he's swimming as well. He's still got lots of challenges. It was a major stroke. However, just getting him back on his wheels again was important part of his rehab. Okay, final slides here, the great outdoors that New Zealand is so famous for. This final slide, I think, just says it all about Green Prescription, really. These people joined a Green Prescription walking group. Uh, they set themselves a goal to walk to the top of Mount Monganui, the Bay of Monty, beautiful part of New Zealand. And here they are, they've done it, and that look on their face says it all. Hey, uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. Please look on the Ministry of Health website. Just search on Green Prescription and you'll find lots and lots more information. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Diana. That was terrific. Um, I have to say, I didn't expect to see uh, an old lady pumping iron uh, or a butcher on a tricycle. I obviously hadn't, hadn't looked hard enough at the presentation uh, that you sent through. Anyway, uh, I'm going to hand you over now to Neil in Sioux in the UK. Okay, uh, this is Neil, um, and uh, I'd like to talk about the, uh, the book prescription strategy and its implementation uh, in Wales. So it's been a, a national scheme in Wales now uh, with the Health Promotion Library since um, 2005. Um, the origins of the scheme, first of all, um, it really came out of uh, a sort of desperation. I, 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 I worked as an academic for um, decades, uh, telling st uh, students how uh, how very uh, impressive the results of psychological therapy were for depression, anxiety, and, and such things. Uh, and I then changed job to become a trainer of clinical psychologists, um, and so worked in the health service. And what I found uh, was that actually very few people had available to them um, psychological treatments. Um, and so I wanted to find some way in which uh, really we could share the, the good news and the good techniques of, in particular, cognitive behaviour therapy. And that was really how the scheme originated. It was, it was out of that uh, desperation, really. So bibliotherapy, which is the, uh, how it's implemented as books on prescription, really comes in two sort of flavours, in a sense. There are the books which are um, focused and specific treatment manuals. So these really are step-by-step, do-it-yourself uh, manuals of uh, self-treatment. And then there's the use of, of books generally, of fiction, of poetry, and so on, uh, to lift the spirits, to inspire, and to distract people. And the books on description is really focusing on bibliotherapy A, as it were. So it's on the, the books which are treatment manuals. Um, it's focus therapy, therapy by the book. And these are written by authors who are experienced um, clinicians, expert therapists, and it's really giving to people the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions that, that they would do in, in live consultation as, as psychologists. Typically, 
uh, cognitive behavior therapy based because apart from anything else, CBT actually lends itself to that sort of formula and manualized uh, version. Some of the other um, approaches to psychotherapy don't do that nearly as well. So we, we use the metaphor of books on prescription. Um, uh, prescription, of course, very familiar to, um, to GPs and to uh, patients alike. So uh, typically, um, somebody would go to the GP and expect maybe a, a prescription for medication. And we were sort of using that in a metaphorical way. And so what happens is that people can be offered a prescription for uh, medication, uh, but also can be offered a prescription for a book. Uh, they would go to the pharmacist for one and go to the public library for the other. It's, so it's a strategy, basically. Books on prescription is a strategy for getting the therapy out there to many more people who would otherwise wouldn't have access to such help. Sort of one-to-one -one therapy in particular, very limited resources, very costly, uh, whereas the books on prescription method is extremely cost-effective. And, of course, it's got huge potential reach because it doesn't call for the resources that most psychotherapy delivery would, would call for. So it involves, of course, the cascading of expertise uh, from specialists, from mental health specialists, to primary care. So, so GPs wouldn't probably be in a good position to choose what are the best books for helping people with depression and anxiety and obsessional problems, etc. Whereas the people who are the specialists, who know the authors of these books, who know the approach and so on, would be in a good position to say to primary care, hey, look, the, these books really are uh, the best that there are. So th there's a, a selection process, uh, quality control at the highest level, because there are very, very many books available. If you if you do a, a sort of search for self-help and depression, uh, then you'll, you'll find thousands of books. Uh, many of them are very good, and many of them, of course, are not. So what we have here is a selection procedure by mental health professionals who are then uh, sharing that knowledge with primary care, who can then prescribe the very best books, uh, which are made available then uh, through the public libraries. So it's a joined-up system. That's, the, in a sense, the, the, the clever thing about it is that we don't really need to invent a great deal here. The books are readily available. They're already written. The libraries are built and they are fully staffed uh, and the doctors uh, are there in their surgeries. So it, the infrastructure is there. It's just that this is a, a joined up way of using that for a very uh, cheap delivery of effective treatment. The background, of course, is that we have huge numbers of people in the community uh, who do have a, a, a mental health issue um, in the UK. And, and it's not very different around the world. It's estimated that one in six of the adult population at any one time will have a diagnosable psychological problem. So it's a huge number. Uh, now, the, there is a sort of pyramid structure so that the, the most um, common problems uh, are the perhaps less serious, the, the mild and moderate problems. And in fact, most cases of uh, mental health uh, are treated uh, in the community, are treated in primary care. 90% of people with depression, anxiety, etc., never get to see a psychologist or a, a psychiatrist. Uh, they are treated by GPs. Uh, and uh, many GPs would say that while they're uh, fairly expert in diabetes and arthritis and such things, that they often feel uh, that there's not a lot that they uh, that they can do uh, in terms of people uh, who have uh, emotional problems, psychological problems, other than sort of reaching for the uh, the pharmacological treatment. Because of course there are two effective approaches to treating psychological distress. Uh, one of which is medication, uh, and the other is psychological. Uh, and the debate has gone on for a very long time as to whether uh, uh, whether one is more effective than the other. But uh, on average, I think the, the opinion would be that they are both e effective um, and some more for some people than, than, than for other people. Um, and of course, uh, therapy, psychotherapy, can be delivered in lots of different ways. Um, we, we tend to think of the, the, the couch with the psychiatrist or psychologist or psychotherapist or counsellor uh, delivering face-to-face -face individual therapy. But, but psychotherapy can be delivered in groups, by email, 
computer-based computer uh, systems, web-based, and of course, bibliotherapy, therapy by the book. And that, of course, is what Books on Prescription uh, uses. There's very good evidence that bibliotherapy is highly effective if the books that are used are high quality. Uh, it really is, there's been a lot of research, a lot of research actually establishing in some cases with randomized control trials uh, that these books are very, very effective. And of course, the costs of delivery are very low. The, the books cost, you know, they're, they're not very costly and they go around the system many times. So it's estimated overall that the cost of a, a delivery of a, a psychological treatment by the book is actually as little as a pound. So if you've got high effectiveness and very low cost, then that tells you that the cost effectiveness is extremely high. This is something which is, uh, I mean, remarkably uh, high cost effectiveness uh, in, uh, in many cases. Well, the, when the idea came to me, I approached uh, librarians, uh, public libraries in Cardiff, in Wales, uh, and I then uh, approached um, uh, fellow psychologists and counsellors for their recommendations on the best books. I did a, a little survey on that. Uh, and then the health service came on board and we, we ran it for two years uh, in Cardiff as a, a local scheme. And basically we drew up a list of, I think it was 35 books if my memory serves me well. This was in about uh, 2003. Self-help books which address really the common emotional issues. So depression, anxiety, social phobia, all of those things, including uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, eating disorders, and also the adult aftermath uh, of sexual abuse. So we had the, the, the most common emotional, psychological problems that GPs were seeing in their surgery, and we had uh, uh, one or two or three books uh, for each of these, highly selected, highly recommended. Most of these books, as I've mentioned, followed a structured cognitive behavior therapy approach. So step-by-step -step treatment uh, programs, uh, same sort of um, uh, self-help uh, or same sort of uh, procedures that they would get if they were actually being treated by a psychologist, but this written up in self-help form. So the initially it was uh, GPs who were the prescribers, uh, but before long uh, we got a lot of interest from other people and saw no reason not to expand the prescriber base to counsellors, nurses, psychiatrists, midwives, uh, and so on. And we found also that although the original aim was for it to be uh, for uh, uh, primary care, that actually there were lots of other settings. Um, there, were, there were psychiatric clinics which were saying, well, why can't we use that as well? Even hospital psychiatric wards were saying that it would be useful to have these books uh, uh, on the ward and so on drug and alcohol centers, voluntary organizations, and so on. So the whole idea sort of took off. Um, and uh, then what happened was that because it was so, uh, it was looking so good, it was looking successful, um, then we, we expanded. In fact, the Welsh government uh, uh, suggested that this would be very good uh, to go from a Cardiff-based scheme, Cardiff being the capital of Wales, uh, to becoming a national scheme across Wales. Uh, and that happens. And I'm going to hand over now uh, to Sue Thomas, my colleague, uh, who's going to tell you about the National Wales scheme. Thank you, Neil. Um, so this slide just gives you um, a picture of Wales um, and useful to know that we have a population of Wales of three million. Um, and this is telling you about the um, t development of the All Wales scheme. Um, just um, a slide which um, is nowhere near as complicated as, as the one you've seen from Diana. Um, so the Health Promotion Library, um, and we'll have a bit more detail in the next slides, is actually part of Public Health Wales. Um, and in terms of how the um, NHS is organised in Wales, um, health is a devolved function. So that is a responsibility of the National Assembly for Wales. Um, and across Wales, we have seven health boards and three All Wales NHS Trusts, of which Public Health Wales is one. Um, Public Health Wales, and I'm not going to read all this information on the slide, um, but Public Health Wales is a function to protect and improve health and well-being and reduce health inequalities for people in Wales. And specifically, and very importantly on that slide, 
is the emphasis on partnership working so that a unified approach, Public Health Wales can't do it alone. A bit of background so you've got some context. The, the Health Promotion Library um, was something that I actually established in 1989. Um, and we must be doing something right because I'm still, still here and we're still going. Um, we became part of Public Health Wales um, in 2011. Prior to that, we'd actually spent some time in Welsh Government, uh, which was an extremely useful um, occupation and time there um, to learn about the policy process. As you can see from this slide, the aim of the Health Promotion Library is to make health and well-being information easily accessible to everybody in Wales. That's a bit of a challenge for us, um, with a population of 3 million and 3 library staff. Um, so very, very importantly is the partnership work that we do um, with libraries, but in addition to that, with NHS and the third or voluntary sector. So in terms of what we do as a health promotion library, we're there to do a couple of things. Um, we're there to actually deal with inquiries for information around health and well-being, and we deal with around 6,000 annually. Um, sometimes that figure is quite difficult to actually calculate. But we also do a lot of um, providing of information. Um, and one of the most useful things that we do um, is to actually make it easy for people not just in the NHS, but also in third sector um, and the private sector to actually get hold of um, still physical leaflets and other resources like alcohol wheels, um, alcohol beakers, which are commonly used by pharmacies. So we make that information easily available so that people who have got little time can actually get that information to support their activities. We do a lot of actually producing of information and again, the idea there is to make it easy for people to find what they're actually looking for. We know that people locally want to actually run events, but they want to actually do that by um, linking those to what's happening. There's always a day of something, a week of something, and they want to link that together. Um, so to make that easy for people, we actually bring together all that information to one easy health events calendar. It's available on our website. But also we know that a lot of people still like to print that off and put it on their walls, so that's available. We also do a quarterly news bulletin, and the idea of that is again to bring together short snippets of information in one integrated whole, making it easy for people to get the information and then follow up if they want to get further information. We do have a lending library of books, um, and we are beginning to um, look at e-books. Um, but I'm not quite sure at the moment whether people are going to be that interested in the ebooks, but we are trialing that. We don't actually want to um, just ask people to come um, to our premises, but it's very important that we get out and about. So where we can, we go to local large conferences, small conferences, so we actually take the information out to the people that need it. Very key to what we're doing um, is to actually work with the public libraries across Wales and we very much want to develop a health and well-being offer. And the idea of that offer is to actually deliver health and well-being benefits to the people of Wales through actually the public library network and our associated partners. Key to actually doing this um, was actually to make a strategic approach to the delivery of what we're trying to do, to look at marketing this offer and to measure the impact. And clearly, the book prescription Wales is a major part of what we're actually trying to do. So the first All Wales scheme for adults with mild to moderate mental health conditions was actually launched in 2005. At that stage, the Mental Health and Vulnerable Groups Division in Welsh Government um, very generously funded a collection of the books on the book list which would be made available in all public libraries across Wales. And that was no mean feat actually getting all those books together and getting them distributed. But in anticipation of high demand for this material, based on the inquiries coming to libraries, some library services actually bought additional collections. So how does the actual scheme work? Well, the scheme works in, in two ways. Um, as well as the prescriptions, 
that are issued by the professionals that, that Neil referred to. It's also a self-referral scheme. So this, the books are actually kept um, on open shelves in the libraries, along with other books on health and well-being. So people can actually go to the shelves and borrow the books themselves. The prescriptions, um, and again we'll, we'll see a prescription in the next slide, these are actually issued by the health professionals and then people can actually take these prescriptions to the nearest library and they can actually borrow the books. Very importantly, because for many people um, this may be the first time or a long time since they've actually been in a library, they don't actually have to be a library member already to actually borrow the books though they are encouraged to join. So that actually is um, a copy of the prescription that actually is written um, and they are still physically written scripts, um, so familiar to the patients. This is slightly different from the um, way in which libraries deal with many of the books that they've got. It's for the professional to actually say how long they think the book would be useful to somebody and the libraries actually issue the books for that period. Um, libraries also don't fine people if the books don't come back on time. And many people <coughs> who are actually suffering from mental health problems actually need these books for a very long time, but they may also have lives, which means that they're not able to return books on time. So this is a very important um, aspect. And I've referred again to the books being kept on open shelves Initially, some of the libraries actually had um, closed collections, but now all libraries have these books on the open shelves. In 2011, um, the Book Prescription Wales Scheme was actually relaunched, and the list was updated, and now, as well as the books that were on the original list, we have titles on chronic fatigue and dementia. Um, you won't be able to see this slide in, in a huge detail, but that gives you the um, book list um, and it goes on to the next page and all this information is actually available on the Health Promotion Library's website. In order to make sure we know what's happening with the Book Prescription Wales Scheme, we do routinely collect information um, on the total issues of the books, particularly to find out how much is prescribed and how much is actually borrowed without the prescription. We also try and keep information on the numbers of prescriptions issued and who actually is doing the prescribing. It's fair to say, and I've spent a long time talking to public library colleagues, that currently the collection of this data is actually quite difficult and it can be a bit time consuming to do. It's hopeful that probably next year there will be a library management system and that will actually make this thing much easier. So this is really just to give you some idea of the figures and you can see that there are huge numbers of the books actually being borrowed. Um, just over 20,000 um, of the books were actually borrowed in a year period um, between July 2012 and June 2013. What's also very interesting from this slide is that um, a small proportion, 19%, um, were done through prescription. But what this doesn't also capture is the number of patients who actually didn't want to go to the library to borrow the books, but actually bought their own copies. It's very clear, and it has been a trend for some time, that of the books, there are ones that are most popular. So we have the overcoming anxiety, mind over mood, overcoming low self-esteem, and overcoming anxiety, stress, and panic. And these have been the most popular titles um, virtually every time we've actually done this survey and collected the data. Um, in terms of the prescribers, um, and again there has been a consistency here, the majority of the prescribers are actually general practitioners. So they are the GPs, um, but there are um, increasing numbers of the community mental health teams prescribing and indeed practice counsellors. Interestingly enough, um, the least popular books, um, and again there's a trend here, are the ones which focus on specific mental conditions, the eating disorders, the dementia and memory loss books, and the chronic fatigue. 
we try where we can um, to collect as much qualitative feedback. Um, and initially, um, we try feedback forms in all of the books. Um, and some of these have actually been returned to the Health Promotion Library. This hasn't worked as well as we would have liked, um, so we are looking at other ways of collecting that. Um, an All Wales Alliance for Research and Development um, in Health and Social Care um, did actually carry out an evaluation of book prescription Wales in 2006, um, and I can send the links for that if anybody's interested. Currently, we have some postgraduate students um, in the University of South Wales, and they're actually doing research at the moment into the scheme, working with Neil and the director of Powell Wales, also at the University of South Wales. Um, the comments that we have about the scheme, and, and we have lots of these, um, come from um, people, for example, the Welsh Government's Director of Mental Health Services at the original launch of the All Wales Scheme in 2005. And he's referring here to the importance of actually improving the choice for patients, as well as actually giving other options for GPs and counsellors to offer to their patients. It's really interesting to get the views of the GPs, and this was a GP involved in the pilot schemes that Neil referred to who says, this is a great alternative for GPs and patients to standard treatment with medication, allowing people to continue in work and take control of their conditions themselves. We've had some recent feedback from a survey that we're in the process of analysing, and that makes it clear that the book scheme is, a, book scheme is actually used alongside other interventions and that it's really good for multiple uses. And particularly interestingly, that it gets people who are on a waiting list for some therapy as it gets them in the right frame of mind and used to the cognitive behavioural therapy techniques. We are also getting patient feedback about the value of having this scheme in libraries. And I think this is really important in that not only is this person actually saying that they're finding the books informative, helping them come to terms with their illness, but also confidence about actually going out into a library and finding information um, in the library system. And another patient actually saying, you know, it helped me analyse problems and solve worries. The challenges of this um, scheme, um, very much um, from the library angle, um, that they are really keen to get more health professionals involved in prescribing the books. Um, an occupational hazard for librarians, but particularly with this scheme, is the books do go missing a lot. Um, but if you look at the cost effectiveness figures that Neil talked about earlier, this, in some regards that is not a problem. Um, but certainly libraries, um, you know, where they are strapped for cash, that is, a, is an issue that needs to be looked at. And certainly we need something around better marketing of the scheme to raise awareness. The final things I want to actually talk to you about um, are some developments of the scheme. And recently, Welsh Government um, actually worked with um, child and adult mental health colleagues and librarians um, to develop a scheme um, which uses the same um, principles as the adult scheme as an all Wales scheme for children and young people. And they were very keen to actually have a new name for this scheme. So they called it Better With Books Wales. Um, and this is our little logo. Um, and we're looking to see whether somebody might actually come up with a name for the logo. Um, so we might run a competition for that. Um, these books are actually covering topics um, which include things like divorce, bullying, low self-esteem, bereavement, depression, anger. There are many other things covered. Importantly, this scheme has books which are for parents and anybody caring for children, but there are also books on the scheme that actually are for the children and young people themselves. And you can see the link there to the actual scheme. So if you're interested in keeping in touch with the Health Promotion Library, um, as I said, we do a quarterly e-bulletin, and within that, um, we have updates about the Book Prescription Wales scheme. So if you want to find out the latest news and developments, that's one way of doing it. 
Um, you can check out the Health Promotion Library's website um, and see our latest bulletin. Um, and it's easy to um, email us at hplibrary at wales.nhs.uk. And if you want to contact me afterwards for any questions, those are my contact details. Thanks ever so much for listening. Okay, thank you, Sue. Uh, and thank you, Neil. Uh, that was great. Um, okay, we've got some time for questions now. Um, and the f I'll take the first, first question here. Looks like it's for Neil. Um, how has the books on prescription developed outside of Wales? Are there any ways in which the idea itself could be developed further? It has expanded in, in various ways. I mean, there was uh, interest uh, right away from, obviously, England, from Scotland, from Ireland, and so on. And, but what happened was, in England, for example, it's very interesting, there was a, a sort of patchy development in the sense that lots of local library systems were uh, almost reinventing the wheel. They were coming up with their, their own book lists and so on. I mean, usually um, mapped onto the, the Wales uh, one. Um, but And then about three years ago, there was a survey which showed um, that 85% of, um, of, of libraries uh, in, across England now um, were uh, had some sort of um, uh, scheme in place. Um, and then uh, the reading agency, a, a leading sort of reading charity in England, decided that it really would be a good idea to get a unified uh, national scheme in England. And so that was launched, and that's been an enormous success with, uh, I think, the last, uh, uh, the full year, uh, it was 275 prescriptions uh, that were issued, an enormous amount. So that's one... Uh, and also, actually, it was interesting with uh, Diana here, there is actually a scheme in Otago in New Zealand, uh, again, based on the Wales scheme, and uh, that's been going for three or four years. Not a national scheme yet in New Zealand, but uh, uh, but certainly some interest there. Uh, and in Denmark and Sweden and so on. So there's lots of interest, media interest as well, um, uh, across the globe, I suppose. Um, in terms of the developments, uh, not sort of geographically, but in other ways, um, there has been the, there is in England now, there is a, 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 a sort of sister scheme, which is particularly a whole list of books uh, on dementia for, uh, for uh, people suffering from dementia at the early stage and also for carers. And actually the the, the, right at the beginning, I, I sort of mapped out where this could go, and it seemed to me that the biggest and most exciting area would actually be for chronic physical illness, the self-management of. Uh, I believe it's the case that a half of all health expenditure in the NHS is on 10 chronic diseases. It's the fact that they are chronic, and things like diabetes, arthritis, and so on. And self-management, effective self-management, would, would just cut down the bill, you know, potentially in terms of the amount of GP time taken and all the rest of it, enormously. And as I say, the delivery of these treatments is actually about a pound. It's, it's just remarkably cheap for remarkable gains. It, it's, a, it's, you know, it's a sadness, really, that this hasn't been taken up. Um, so that, that's some of the ideas. And then, of course, the child scheme as well. OK, uh, thanks, Neil. Um, and it's, this is a question for me now. Um, I'm just, to what extent is this also uh, about empowerment uh, in the sense that perhaps like pe people are playing a part in their own treatment, so they, they're going and getting the book uh, and, and reading it? And of course, CBT is teaching people skills which will not only help them with this, as it were, bout of depression, but are giving them skills for life. It's almost like you know, teaching somebody to fish. You're giving them skills that, that, that can be useful for a, a, a very long time. Yeah, absolutely. Very much empowering. And people, the feedback, the qualitative feedback we get, often, you know, people are saying, I now feel that I'm in control. And GPs also love to feel that people are collaborating and actually taking some responsibility. And that, of course, would go with physical health as well for things like obesity and, and diabetes and so on. I mean, giving people the reins, as it were, but showing them through the books the best way that they can actually do this self-management. Okay, thanks, Neil. Um, question here for Diana. What decides whether GPs get involved in green prescriptions? Uh, could you just say a bit about that, please, Diana? 
Um, as I said before, it was a real push getting GPs involved initially. However, now that the patients are coming back and thanking them for a green prescription, we, we're really into that positive cycle now. So that's one reason that, that the referrals have um, have changed so much. But also, with the move to the Ministry of Health, green prescription is embedded into many different strategies. Like for example, the new diabetes strategy was just launched last week, and it has got green prescriptions in there. So, and it's um, a requirement to be in the district health board plans and things like that. So, it's around embedding it into clinical um, work, into general practice, and also into you know, strategic documents. So, there's real push and pull factors going on there. Okay, thanks. Um, I've got another question uh, for you, Diana. Um, who owns and runs the green prescriptions facilities? So, I only mentioned the, the YMCA and the uh, Velodrome, I think, in the Splash Centre. I mean, who who owns uh, and runs these these centres? Yeah, they they do they do tend to be owned by the um, yeah by the the council, and a lot of them now have gone out to right. um, tender for the actual service delivery. But no, they they do belong to the community and they're used for a range of of community um, activities. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, I've got a question for Sue here. How do you deal with people's concerns around privacy when checking out books? Uh, has it been an issue? Um, to be honest, in, in the time that um, the scheme has been running, um, I can only think of one example which certainly um, did cause a problem and, and came back to us and we then dealt with that through the head of service. Um, but, I mean, as I say, frontline library staff, um, and increasingly they are having training um, in dealing with a number of health issues and I mean the value of having the, the books actually on the open shelves um, and particularly as well now that um, you know libraries the majority of libraries have the self-issue system. Okay thanks Sue. Uh, I've got another question uh, for either for Neil or for yourself. Um, how do you tackle low literacy? So one of the um, pieces of work that many public libraries are doing um, are read aloud um, groups um, and this is structured reading um, usually um, of a an extract from a book um, and a poem etc but some places are actually doing these read aloud sessions with some of the information from the books on the book prescription scheme um, yeah. so again that actually is a way of helping people who might have difficulty with some literacy issues there are um, discussions I know with publishers about trying to lower the reading age of the books, but obviously there are going to be some people who can't read, um, and the unfortunate thing is that that means that they, you know, the bibliotherapy approach is not for them. If we think of it in this way, though, if there are people who can be uh, who can get help through a book, that means there's then more time available from professionals to be able to deal face to face with those people who are not able to benefit from that scheme. Okay, thanks. Uh, and there's another question uh, again uh, for Sue and Neil, I, I think. Uh, what efforts are being made by GPs to encourage reading more generally? Not specific books, but the idea of reading. One of the um developments that the reading agency has led on um, are mood boosting books um, and these are books, um, literature books um, and while that scheme is not supported um, nationally in Wales many public libraries have actually got copies of those books um, and they are certainly proving extremely popular um, and as I said previously um, certainly um, in the southeast region, and I think it's happening in, in other regions in Wales, this read aloud work, so this is, is slightly different from the reading agency, it's the reader organisation, and yeah. librarians are being trained as facilitators to lead small groups, and that's actually happening in libraries, but also it's happening in prisons, it's happening in care homes, um, and so people are actually um, using... Um, not necessarily just good literature, um, but literature that appeals to people. Um, my colleague in the Health Promotion Library um, has now been in a care home 
um, for quite some time, and she's actually reading some of the books um, that the mainly ladies would have read when they were children, and that's bringing out all sorts of um, benefits to them. So it's happening, but it's not necessarily being prescribed. Okay, thanks, Sue. Um... Uh, we've got a final question uh, for, for Diana. Please could you say more about the role of the regional sports trusts and how gyms, rec centres, etc. can become providers? Most weeks I will get um, phone calls from gym owners asking if they can um, be green prescription providers and in actual fact the ministry and the DHPs dictate who are the providers. When Green Prescription came from the recreation and sport era, it came with that set of providers which were mainly regional sports trusts and they have stayed the same. The district health boards are now out to go out, able to go out to tender for those services if they want to um, and one of them has so far and it ended up with the same provider. So it's, pr it's pretty rigorous because there is a whole lot of um, the contract holder guidelines and they have to be able to show that they're able to do the data entry, you know, produce the outcomes, etc. So if, for example, there's a new gym in town and they want their, um, they think they've got a ready market and green prescription patients, it's then up to the green prescription area manager based in the sports trust or wherever to go and actually inspect the gym to have a look not only if it's safe and clean and that sort of thing but to look at some of the classes to see if it's a safe environment for beginner um, you know beginner activities so not too not too much lycra not too many mirrors etc so yeah. there is um, a registered um, provider list of a whole list of criteria that they have to have to meet so yeah it's pretty it's pretty rigorous because it rests and falls, you know, the reputation of something was to go horribly wrong, well, I think even after this period of time, the general practice might just walk away from it. So we're really, really very careful. Okay, thanks. So the sports trusts um, are kind of more about management and, and uh, overseeing delivery rather than the direct providers. Okay. Okay, I don't see any more questions and I'm, I'm conscious of the time now. Uh, I just want to uh, thank our speakers, uh, Diana O'Neill of the New Zealand Ministry of Health, Neil Frood of the uh, Happiness Consultancy, and Sue Thomas of Public Health Wales. Uh, thank you to you for listening.